But still 
when you fill the room. You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you feel me. Calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you feel me. worship you this morning and that is our prayer that you would meet us in this place we claim the promise that even if it were just two of us here singing out your praises singing out your name that you would show up in a powerful way just i pray that you would fall in this place heavy today that hearts would be moved to you we love you we worship you and we honor you in this place in your precious and powerful name amen you guys can have a seat Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one who does not follow the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sin. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Blessed is the one. Blessed is. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, "You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance." In the shadow of thy 
I praise God you are all here joining us, worshiping with us, lifting up your hearts and your minds to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know if you noticed coming in, but we've done, we did some yard work yesterday. We had something like 30-some-odd folks out here working hard yesterday morning. And uh, for all of you that were able uh, to come out, I, I tried to talk to everybody, but if I didn't get to talk to you, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all of your work and thank you for all that you have done to uh, uh, make the house of the Lord look nice. A, a federal drug enforcement agency agent went to this ranch in Texas, and he started talking to the, the old rancher there. And in the discussion, he says, I'm going to have to inspect your ranch for illegal activity. Well, the, the old rancher goes, Okay, fine, go ahead, knock yourself out. Just don't go in that field over there. And the DEA agent just looked at him and says, okay, let's get something straight, bucko. I have the full force and authority of the federal government behind me. He reached his pocket and pulled out and he said, you see this badge? This badge says I go wherever I want, whenever I want. No questions asked or answered. Are we clear? And this old rancher goes, okay, fine. No problem. Go ahead. Do whatever you want. And then he turned and went about doing his chores. And then a little bit later, he hears this blood-curdling scream coming from that field over there. And he looks up, and here's this DEA agent running for his life because this rancher's meanest biggest bull is chasing after him and gaining ground on him. And so the, the, the rancher saw that this, this guy is scared to death, so he drops everything he's doing. He goes running up to the fence, and he yells at the top of his lung, show him your badge. <laughs> yeah, how'd that work out for him? How many times have you, we, acted like this DNA, uh, DNA agent disregarding wise counsel and guidance, just throwing away, only to find out somewhere down the road, you start running for your life. How many times have we turned our back on God's wisdom, guidance, and directions only to find ourselves at some point in need of a course realignment. How many times have you ignored what you should know to be right, only to stop and acknowledge what you had ignored? How many of you answered those three questions honestly? Like in hello, me, every day. Our core passage for this week comes from Psalm 110, the very first verse. King David writes these words, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now this passage is very significant. It's significant because it is the most quoted psalm in the entire New Testament. 25 times this verse in Psalms chapter 110, verse 1, is quoted 25 times, and many of those times by Jesus himself. So what makes Psalm 110 so significant? Well, I think the answer lies in what some biblical scholars call this psalm. They call this psalm the gospel of the psalms. Now, when we talk about the gospels, we're usually talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four books in the New Testament. But by calling this the gospel of the psalms, it is saying that this one psalm 
is pointing to the life and the mission and the purpose of Jesus Christ, why he came to this earth. So let's get a little clearer picture on what this conversation uh, was and why Jesus felt important to talk about it. When Jesus was um, toward the end of his ministry, we have recorded conversations with him and the Pharisees, where the Pharisees are just peppered him with all kinds of questions over and over and over. They're asking him things like, uh, should we pay taxes? Or what is the greatest commandment? And every time they would ask him a question, he was always able to turn the tables around on them and just catch them breathless, that they really couldn't come to an answer. And in Matthew chapter 22, we read uh, some of this conversation with the, the Pharisees constantly asking Jesus questions. But then at the end of chapter 22, of Matthew 22, Jesus asks the Pharisees a question. He asked them this. Verse 42 of Matthew 22. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Well, the Pharisees answer, well, he is the son of David. And then Jesus responded, well, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? And then Jesus quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. And the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And then Jesus goes on to say, if then David calls him Lord, how is he the son? Well, Jesus stumped them there. In fact, he stumped them so abruptly that the Pharisees did not ask him one more question after that discussion. Now, talk about the Messiah was very prevalent throughout uh, Israel in the time that Jesus was uh, ministering. And and a big part of that is because of Psalm 110, a psalm that everyone talked about pointing to the Messiah that was going to become and who that Messiah was going to be. So let's take a little bit of time this morning and look at Psalm 110, break it down a little bit and see why it is called the gospel of of the Psalms. The very first thing we see is in Psalms 110 answers the question, who is Jesus? And he answers first by saying, Jesus is the mighty ruler. Jesus is the mighty ruler. Quoting Psalm 110 verse 1, was declaring to all that would listen that he himself was the Messiah, the mighty ruler that they were expecting. Let's read the first three verses, Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning the dew of your youth will be yours. Now, the English translation of verse 1 leaves a lot to be desired. Going from, from the, the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, it, it leaves out the emphasis, strong emphasis of it. Now, God earlier on promised David that he and his bloodline would rule over Israel forever. Now, in that day, it was quite quite the custom that the father, the the patriarch, was always held in the highest regard and everyone that came after him in a lower regard. So the idea that all of the kings that would follow after David would be somewhat less than what David was. And that's why the emphasis was that the son of David would be the Messiah, but the son of David would never match up to David himself. But the way the chapter, verse 1 is written changes that emphasis completely. Now, understand, when the Bible was written, after it was written, it was copied over and over and over again by different scribes and different copyists. 
And they held the name of God to such a holy level that they would never write the name of God. We talked last week, the name of God, when God told Moses, my name is I am who I am. They would never write that because it was too holy for them to write. So they took the first consonant of each of those uh, uh, words, I am who I am, and came up with what we know as Yahweh, Y-H-W-H. And they would write Yahweh instead of I am. And when you look in your Bibles, most English translations, when you see the word Lord in all capitals, that is God's proper name, Yahweh. So what we are reading here is we're reading, verse 1 says, Yahweh says to my Lord. Now the second Lord is uh, uh, the Hebrew word Adonai, which literally means my Lord or my master. So what we have here, what we in reading it, it says, the Lord says to my Lord, it's actually saying God says to my Lord. God says to my master. So in saying that, Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees that they've got it all wrong. They're completely mistaken. God wasn't talking to David. He was talking to Jesus when he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Did you know that God was left-handed? The little boy was asking his dad, he said, Dad, did you know God was left-handed? And the father asked, he said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, Jesus is sitting on his right hand. How could he do what? Anyway. <laughs> my Lord says, my, this is really, really significant. Uh, and I want you to understand the beauty and the significance of my Lord Yahweh says to my Lord, my master. This is the second time and the last time we have recorded a conversation between Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit. The first time is in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when God says to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our own image. And then here we see God talking to Jesus and then David re getting this from the Holy Spirit when he says, uh, sit at my right hand. And the second reason why this is very important is because through the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David prophesies who Jesus is and what Jesus will become, how he will rule victorious over all opposition. And in this, we see three things in these first three verses. God makes three promises. The first promise is that Jesus will defeat his enemy. That's what we read in verse 1. The second thing, God promises that Jesus will extend his kingdom. That's what we read in verse 2. And the third, God will give Jesus a great and mighty army. That's what we read in verse 3. And brothers and sisters, we are that army, the church is the army of God. And because of that, we can lift our heads high and keep them high because the battle, the victory, is assured. <laughs> My fellow warriors, let not your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in Jesus who is seated at God's right hand. In the first three verses, we see that Jesus is the mighty ruler Verse 4, we see also that Jesus is the forever priest. Verse 4, we read, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we read about Melchizedek back in Genesis chapter 14. A group of kings gathered together and they invaded several cities, Sodom being one of them. And in Sodom, Abraham's nephew lived, Lot. And Lot was taken captive. And when Abraham heard about this, he gathered up his own army, went in and defeated all of those kings and was able to rescue Lot and the rest of the captives. And as Abraham was returning home, Abraham and his army 
was returning home, Melchizedek came out, greeted them, provided food and drink for the armies, and then Melchizedek blessed them in the name of the Lord. And after that, Abraham gave a tithe of all of their spoils, 10% of all their spoils, Abraham gave to Melchizedek. Now, here's what's significant about Melchizedek. Melchizedek, his name means man of righteousness. And he was the king of Salem, which also could be translated the king of peace. What we see about Melchizedek, we only see in the four verses in chapter 14. But Melchizedek is said by many to be the most significant character in all of the Old Testament because he is used as an example of who Jesus Christ will be. See, we don't know a whole lot about Melchizedek. We do not know when he was born or when he died, but that's the point. And he was a man, of course, he died. But in having no record of his beginning and no record of his end, the Hebrew writer in, in the book of Hebrews points out as Jesus is being foundational to the understanding that Jesus is the priest of God, the high priest that stands between us and God, represents us between, uh, between us and God. Now, in, in, in no history of Judaism was there ever a priest who was also a king? A priest and a king, they were two separate offices by God's design, by God's command, and by God's correction. The king took care of the affairs of his people. He protected his people. He fought for his people. Where the priest represented God to the people and represented the people to God and made sacrifices for the people to God and, pro and proclaimed the blessings of God to the people. They were two separate things. But here what we see is that God in Jesus is uniting the king kingship and the priesthood into one person. Dave, in David, Jesus is the forever king. In Melchizedek, Jesus is the forever priest. And the mighty ruler and the forever priest. And finally, in Psalms 110, we see that Jesus is also the mighty conqueror. The king priest is a conqueror. Now, throughout the book of, of Psalms, uh, there, there's different psalm that has been identified as what they call royal psalms. Psalms in which the king goes into battle and comes out victorious in each time. And verses 5 through 7 is emphasis of that. A reading 5 through 7 of, of Psalm 110, we read, The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He shall shatter chiefs over the whole earth. And he will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Now, we don't have enemies like David. We will not go into war in the way that David went into war. David fought battles pretty much his entire life fighting against the armies of other gods. But what we do have, according to Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, our fight is not against flesh and blood, but our fight is against the rulers, against the powers, against the evil forces in this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's where our battle is fought. But one thing is absolutely assured, our victory is guaranteed. We have Jesus Christ leading us in the battle, and he will be victorious. Now, you may be uh, taken aback a little bit, reading verses 5 through 7, in the, the brutal description of the battle that will be fought. And here's what we must understand. We must understand. 
The battle is raging around us. But while we have today, as long as we have today, today is the day of salvation. While we have today, we have the opportunity to hear God calling out to all of us to come to him. We have today, right now. But there will come a day, as several of the Old Testament uh, prophets said, there will be a day that is called the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And on that day, it will be too late. On that day, the great day, when God's kingdom shall be established and all of God's warriors will be gathered together into his kingdom and overseen by God and in the presence of God and God in their presence. But it will also be a very dreadful time when those who refuse to listen and who rejected the sacrifice of Jesus Christ will be collected together and condemned into hell. It will be a dreadful day. And that's what we must understand. Every one of us sitting here this morning must understand that we're going to be either overwhelmingly excited or overwhelmingly in anguish and dread because of decisions we make today. Jesus is exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father, and his kingdom will be established forever as the kingdom, the king forever, the priest forever, the conqueror who will overcome all That one day, Jesus will conquer Satan once and for all. And for all who are his faithful, fully surrendered disciples, he will gather them together. We must understand Jesus is coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, maybe soon. But it is a guarantee that Jesus is coming, and it will be a glorious day for his faithful. And so we must ask the question, is that you? If not, Jesus is calling today. Pray with me. Father, we come to you in awe. We come to you in wonder. And we come to you in expectation, knowing who you are and knowing what we are through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you for loving us so much that you sent your Son to give of his life so fully so that we all may be victorious through his victory in the resurrection. Father, I pray if there are anyone here that has yet to respond, that they accept today who you are and turn their eyes upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is calling. He has been calling throughout the ages for us to turn our eyes to him, to see him as our king of forever, as the priest forever, as the conqueror who has guaranteed our victory. So the invitation now is for you. If you have not been obedient and accepting and have made that step forward in becoming part of the kingdom of God, as we sing this last song, this invitation is for you. Will you come as we stand and sing? For the moment where I'm still in your presence, all the noise dies down, the 
Lord, speak to me now. You have all my attention. I'll linger, listen. I can't miss a thing. Lord, I know my heart wants more of you. My heart wants something new, so I surrender all. And all I want is to live within your love, be undone by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. So I will open up again, throw my fears into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. Oh, 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 no hesitation in your love and affection it's the sweetest of all Lord I know my heart wants more of you my heart wants something new so I surrender all and all
desire is to know you deeper. Lord, I will open up again, throw my feet into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of heaven. You may have a seat. As we come into our time of communion, we invite all believers to partake with us. You should have grabbed your communion elements on the way in, and if you did not, you can just raise your hand, and someone will bring those to you. About two weeks ago, Apple held their reveal event for spring where they showed, uh, showed off their new iPhone and new iPads and new computers, and, you know, it's, it's Apple's biannual event to tell you that what you have is obsolete and no good and that you need new, better, and best. And, you know, Apple's not the only company, of course, that does that. I mean, we are bombarded in the world with messages of telling us that we have to have new and better and best. I mean, from our tech gadgets to our breakfast cereal, we're told that. That something's always better. That the old shouldn't be trusted. And yet we come here on Sunday mornings and we hear a message that is two, four thousand years old about how to come into relationship with God. And there's messages in the world today that are are saying, hey, that old message of how to be right with God, that, that's old and obsolete. There's new and better ways to do that. There's new and better ways to appease God. If, if you just be good more, if you have more good than you do bad, then, then that'll appease God. If you hold the door open for people longer, then that'll make God happy. If, if you start the pay it forward line at Starbucks, then that'll really make God happy. That's not what Paul tells us. Paul tells us in Colossians 2, he says, Therefore, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and firm in your faith, just as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving or thankfulness. <clears throat> Be careful not to allow anyone to captivate you through an empty and deceitful philosophy that's according to human traditions and the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form, and you have been filled in him who is the head over every ruler and authority. Having been buried with him in baptism, you also have been raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. And even though you were dead in your transgressions and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, he nevertheless made you alive with him, having forgiven all your transgressions. He has destroyed what was against us, a certificate of indebtedness expressed in the decrees opposed to us. He has taken it away by nailing it to a cross. Disarming the rulers and authorities, he has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the cross the issue in being right with God isn't doing more good than bad the issue in being right with God is making sure that our sins are forgiven and that's only done by Christ on the cross let's pray Father there's a, there's a lot of noise in the world tells us that there's new and better ways to do things. But you established once and for all the way to be made right with you, and that is through relationship with your Son. Through faith in your Son, believing that he went to the cross on our behalf to forgive us of our sins, believing that he rose from the dead so we can have eternal life with you. It's a message that may be old, but it's a message that's true. There's nothing new that's going to be better than that. So, Father, keep us focused on your eternal message of salvation found in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
knowing by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Lord, how I long been up again. Throw my feet into the wind. I am desperate for a touch of dawn. I want is to live within your love. I'm done by who you are. My desire is to know you deeper. Oh, I will open up again. Throw my fears into the wind. I'm desperate for the touch of heaven. As we wrap up this morning, I just want to say thank you for joining us. If you're a first-time guest or visitor, a special thank you for you being out here with us this morning. You should have received a bag on your way in, and inside that bag is a connection card. If you don't mind filling that out and dropping that in the offering box or give that to the greeters on your way out, we'd appreciate that just so we can get to know you a little bit better. This month, I want to remind you that we have this week and next week to wrap up our giving for our food pantry. Our goal for our food pantry is 30,000 food items. Um, again, an item is either a can, a box of non-perishable food, or $1 is also equal to an item. Our goal is 30,000. We currently are at 7,631, so we're about a quarter of the way there, um, which means we have a lot of a lot of food to make up in the next two weeks. Uh, so as you, as you come back next week for the close of this, if you could please swing by the store, just pick up some extra non-perishables, bring those in next week. That would be amazing. We'd greatly appreciate that. Um, just want to close with a couple of, of calendar announcements for you to mark down on your calendar, put in your phone. Um, Sunday, March 27th, it's from 6 to 7.30 in the evening, so that's next Sunday, 6 to 7.30. Dan is going to be offering a class on baptism. Um, if you have never been baptized or you are interested in baptism or have questions about baptism, this is an opportunity for you to come out and just kind of learn a little bit more about what baptism is all about, um, the importance of baptism in your walk with Christ. Uh, so make sure if that's something you've not done that you come out to learn more about that. Also, on April 3rd at 6 p.m., that would be the following Sunday after that, the first Sunday in April, uh, here in the church we're going to have a night of worship. Matt and the worship team are going to be leading us in a night of worship. Just to come on out, uh, enjoy worshiping the Lord together as a family. So make sure to mark that on your calendars. And then we had a date change. Originally, it was going to be April 10th. It's now moved to April 24th, where we are going to have our beach baptisms in conjunction with Tomoka Christian Church out at Paradise Beach, um, of course, beach side, um, but Paradise Beach, April 24th, starting at 5 p.m., beach baptisms in conjunction with Tomoka Christian Church. So make sure to mark your calendar for that. Let's go ahead and stand. We'll be closing with a word of prayer and then we will be dismissed. Our Father in heaven, we come today having lifted our voices in praise, having opened our ears and our hearts to your message, and now we go into a world that needs to know what we heard. We go into a world needing to know that your Son is Lord, that he is your Messiah, your chosen one, that he has come to redeem all of us. And Father, we go leaving this place of refuge, this place of, of comfort, are surrounded by other believers into a world that's dark and hurting. And I pray that you give us strength to be bold, to share the love, the light of Christ that is in our hearts. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for giving us opportunity to be encouraged in continuing our walk. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You guys have a great week.